Uh, thank you very much, Benjamin. Uh, I'm from Japan, but uh, currently working as a research, research fellow at Duke and US in Singapore. I, I must declare that I'm a member of the Prosium Medical Advisory Board and uh, uh, several grants, and I have uh, also conflict interest regarding the associate editor. So in my talk, I'm going to present why do we need advanced cardiac monitoring system, and what is transpulmonary sound dilation system, and how do we use it? As we learned from previous speaker that there is, you know, stroke volume variation, pressure, uh, uh, pulse pressure variation is very important. And using those, maybe we can uh, provide better fluid therapy. In my talk today, I will present from the uh, different uh, perspective of fluid therapy. That means complication. Uh, what supplies we have to pay if we give large amount of fluid inappropriately. That means a dark side of the fluid therapy. You know, in patient with dehydrated and in, uh, hemodynamic instability patient, it's absolutely important to give fluid. However, in sometimes, if we give too much fluid, we would drown the patient. And what is happening there? And what is pathophysiology behind there? The fluid you give to increase the stroke volume, the same amount of fluid will also affect to the lung. And if we give the same amount of fluid to different person, you get edema in one patient and not, uh, you don't uh, increase the edema in another patient. The difference between those is the vascular permeability. So edema is one of the most uh, important uh, complication in critical e-patient and profound effect in outcome. And let's go back to the basics. Primary edema is excess accumulation of fluid in the lung. Our lung have 700 million alveoli. Each one of the alveoli is very small, but the superficial area of both lungs are about 100 square meter. 100 square meter is just as large as a huge tennis court. So, uh, in this uh, normal alveolus and interstitium and capillary, the space outside the capillary is called extravascular lung space. So the fluid in this space is called extravascular lung water. Extravascular lung water will increase in the condition of primary edema. In both cardiogenic primary edema or non-cardiogenic primary edema. However, it is sometimes too difficult to evaluate express lung water in the bedside. The interpretation of the chest X-ray is certainly limited by the certain degree of uh, subjectivity, and there is intra-observer error exists, even among experts. However, we must interpret it chest X-ray accurately, because the current Berwin different definition requires uh, interpretation of the checks x-ray. So the panel of the Berwin definition provided as a typical 12 x-ray that's classified into consistent of LDS type, inconsistent of LDS, and equivocal for LDS. However, at least for me, it's still difficult to interpret this chest x-ray. The typical one. This is a typical X-ray that's categorized into either uh, consistent or inconsistent or equivocal. So now I need audience participation. Who think this picture is consistent with ARDS? Could you please light your hand? Inconsistent with ARDS? Equivocal? Okay. This is a typical example of inconsistent with LDS. How about this one? 
Who think this is consistent with ARDS? Yeah. Two, three. Inconsistent. This is uh, equivocal. This is a typical example of ARDS. I do everywhere in the world about this one, but uh, there is a always diversity of the answer. And this is clearly shown by the Chinese group. This is a multi-spent center prospected before and after training uh, studies. Uh, they use the same 12 examples provided by the panels. And they found that both accuracy and interlocal agreement of the radi radiographic diagnosis of ARDS was poor, even after training with a set of 12 chest X-ray uh, developed by the panel. So it's always difficult. So if you encounter the patient in front of you with decreased cardiac function and increased uh, primary vascular <coughs> permeability, what shall we do? Let's ask to the ex expert, including Michael Pinsky. This is a consensus of the conference report on circulatory shock and hemodynamic, and they suggest to use the transpulmonary thumb duration or PA catheter in patients with severe shock, especially in case of associated ARDS. So what is transpulmonary thumb duration system? The introduction of the transpulmonary thumb duration technique made it possible to estimate several important hemodynamic and pulmonary variables, which is implemented in the two commercially available uh, hemodynamic system, the PICO system and volume view. After injection of the 50 ml of the cold solvent from the central venous catheter, thermistor chipped arterial catheter, the PICO catheter, will detect and draw the thermal duration curve and estimated the, estimate the uh, variables. These variables include cardiac output, cardiac function index, or uh, stroke variation. And in my talk, I will concentrate on the three variables which is unique to this system. First is a global endodiastolic volume. This is a volume of the full cardiac chamber at endodiastolic. It's an index of cardiac preload. So according to this storing for uh, curve, the global and the diastolic volume should be here. And this is not a volume. Uh, this is not a pressure like the central venous pressure or a wedge pressure. It's a volume of the full chamber. Uh, let me give you an example of how to use it. Uh, we sometimes encounter the fluid imbalance uh, related complication after a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage patient. The one is delayed cerebral ischemia, and several uh, studies suggest that this delayed cerebral ischemia is associated with hypovolemia. That's why we sometimes perform triple H, triple H therapy. And for another uh, complication, maybe neurological primary edema, and this is associated with hyperbolemia. So we don't want to, uh, to, the, to make the patient to neither uh, hypovolemia or hyperbolemia. Uh, so after the uh, small study we done, uh, we performed a multicenter prospective study uh, to find the optimal range of global and diastolic volume for fluid management after subarachnoid hemorrhage. And in 180 patients, what we found was there was a significant difference in endodiastolic volume between uh, who occurred the delayed cerebral ischemia and who did not. There was no significant changes in the central venous pressure. So the lower global endodiastolic volume was associated with occurrence of delayed cerebral ischemia. How about with primary edema? There was a significant more global endodiastolic volume was found in patients who had primary edema. And again, there was no difference in central venous pressure. And according to this Kaplan-Meier curve, uh, the high global endodyne volume was associated with occurrence of primary edema. So my conclusion for this study was maintaining global endodyne volume slightly above the normal level may be a promising fluid management goal for preventing potential fluid 
imbalance related complication after subrogate hemorrhage. So what's variable? Another variable that's unique to this uh, system is about extravascular lung water, the degree of the lung, lung edema. The accuracy of the transpulmonary thumb duration derived exopasc lung water was first validated against the gold standard glammetric uh, measurement of uh, exopasc lung water in the animal model. And this is the report from Israel, and they found high accuracy in control and LDS model and congested heart failure models. And in human autopsy study, we perform, uh, we found the postmortem uh, lung weight correlates well with exophagic lung water measured by the PICO system in 30 autopsy cases. A uh, recent study from UK found that in human brain dead patient, before, just before the transplantation of the lung, uh, they found Gravimetry measurement of extravascular lung water correlates well with uh, extravascular lung water measured by the PICO system. So, what are the reference value? That means, what is the normal range of extravascular lung water in human? We calculated normal reference range of extravascular lung water from 534 autopsy cases with normal rank, and we found that. Uh, 70 point plus or minus 3 might be the normal escobus lung water for human. Our proposed value was later on validated by the different group. Uh, they did a meta analysis of literature and they estimated mean escobus lung water of 7.25 uh, among patients who were undergoing elective surgery who believed to not have primary edema. Now, we recently uh, evaluated a published study that reports exopus lung water by the PICO system, and we investigated the relationship between exopus lung water and the degree of the lung injury according to the PF ratio. And we found exopus lung water correlate well uh, with the severity of lung injury in clinical practice. How, the, how about the correlation with the pathology? Uh, in Japan, every autopsy cases were registered in Japanese autopsy database. So we evaluated 1,688 uh, patients who has diffused alveolar damage. That is a uh, typical uh, pathological finding of ARDS. And using this formula, we estimated excess lung water. What we found was there was a significant difference between the normal lung and a patient who had diffuse alveolar damage. And express lung water of 10 might be the quantitative discriminative threshold for detecting alveolar damage. And express lung water level of 15 represents a 99% of positive predictive value to, 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 de to detect diffuse alveolar damage. So what is the correlation of express lung water versus mortality. This is a landmark study from Sucker and colleague, and what they found was that there was a significant correlation between exopasc lung water and mortality. So the more increase in uh, exopasc lung water, the poorer the outcome. This was confirmed by the systematic review of the literature uh, from Chinese group, and they found the same result. So the initial absolute express lung water increase correlate with uh, outcome, poor outcome in critical ear patient in general. But how about the CEL change, the delta change in the clinical course? Uh, we did a multi-center study in Japan uh, and found that there was a decrease in express lung water in survivor, but we did not find any changes of express lung water in non survivor So wh what we found was that decrease of express lung water during the first 48 hours of LDS was associated with 28-day survival. So how much express lung water? 
God do, do you think I have? A 41-year-old uh, Japanese guy uh, whose body weight is 70 kilograms. Uh, maybe I have 500 ml of exhaust lung water. However, so if my exhaust lung water increased to 700, that means 200 increase, I will get from edema. I'll be happy to take another 200 ml of uh, fluid if it were a beer. However, I don't want any exhaust lung water. The problem with that, are, are we able to detect this change of 200 ml in the large space of the alveoli using this uh, black and white Chex X-ray? I believe that we cannot uh, evaluate, we cannot uh, tell a difference unless we evaluate. So the final topic for me is about the vascular permeability. We know that both, uh, there was an increase, there is an increase uh, in both type of uh, primary edema, either in cardiogenic or ARDS type. How, however, there was a significant difference in the vascular permeability between the two primary edema. Uh, in the transparent sample duration technique, we can estimate uh, permeability by PBPI. For example, if the exovascular lung water increase without the corresponding increase of PVPI, that means the patient has cardiogenic pulmonary edema. On the other hand, if the exovascular lung water increase along with the increase of PVPI, that means the patient has ARDS. Uh, this is nicely uh, shown by the group of uh, John Lee Tupu in 2007. This is a retrospective single center study, and they clearly found that there is a discrimination threshold of 3.0 uh, of PBPI between ALDS and hydrostatic pulmonary edema. And we did perform the multi center prospective study in Japan uh, of the 300 ALDS and pulmonary edema patient, and we found the same result. The cutoff between LDS and congested heart error was 2.8 in our study. So if I summarize all the evidence of express lung water and primary permeability index, we can make this uh, diagram. Uh, this is uh, published in this uh, month's current opinion in critical care. And what we found was that uh, Exposed lung water more than 10 is a rational uh, criteria for pulmonary edema, and permeability more than 3.0 suggests a hyperpermeability, and two, less than 2.5 indicates the patient do not have increased permeability. So, how do we use it? For the case number one and the two, can we? we can quantitatively evaluate the degree of the primary edema using exposed lung water measurement. So in this case, number two is slightly severe in terms of primary edema. However, what is the etiology for that? For case number one, is PBPI is not increased, and case number two, PBPI is hardly increased. So, Case number one is a typical type of cardiogenic pulmonary edema, and number two is uh, typical for the severe ARDS patient. So what is the indication and clinical use for the transpulmonary sample duration technique? We often use for septic shock with ARDS patient and high risk operating management, and there is, in our institution, we use it for the uh, severe pancreatitis patient or severe brown patient and subrocal patient. And uh, we recently uh, published the data regarding post cardiac arrest syndrome patient, and it works. And there are some limitations regarding the uh, estimation of the transpulmonary summation technique. If we have vascular occlusion, you cannot use that, such as pulmonary embolism and such as a severe. Uh, heart barobra disorder, or the patient who are using ECMO. 
So in conclusion, transpolymer samodaryl provide both hemodynamic and primary variables, and experts suggest to use it, and we can quantitatively evaluate lung status. So by using this monitoring, we can uh, describe the whole picture of the both hemodynamic and primary status quantitatively. Uh, thank you very much.